Great. Okay, so I think I think we'll we'll, we'll make a start. So we're very privileged indeed uh, to have the co-creator of the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange Method, which is used with mil trillions of network connections every single day, and the whole of the security of the internet depends fundamentally uh, on it. Although we now use elliptic curve methods rather than yes, the, the curve speed curve logs. Curve. Uh, that, uh, that you created, it's still basically still the same. So it's lasted 40 or 50 years or so. Almost 50 years. Uh, and by the way, I still have the same desk at which I came up with the algorithm, which I'm sitting at right now. Oh, that's that that's amazing. To keep things forever. That's right. So so Marty is a Turing, ACM Turing Prize winner, which is the equivalent of a Nobel Prize um, in uh, in computer science. He's probably one of the greatest computer scientists of all time, and he's also worked and mentored with many of the greats uh, in, in our industry. So thanks for joining us so much. A well, couple thank of you weeks for those ago, kind words. And it, it's fun yeah. being Superman for a few minutes. I often say that I go through life like Clark Kent. No one knows who I am. And that's great because I wouldn't want to be Superman all the time. But it's yeah. fun every once in a while when I meet someone whose jaw drops or the kind of introduction you just gave. So thank you. Yeah, that's right. So, I, I mean, I think on, on, you sh on your shoulders, we build the, inter the security of the of the Internet. Uh, so we, we spoke to Witt um, uh, a few couple of weeks ago, and he said he was living in Woodside, mm -hmm. which I think is a, just a little tiny 5,000 population to the north. Of uh, yeah, it's about uh, less than 10 kilometers away, five miles. Yeah. And he was actually moving uh, house. Uh, at, oh, right. At time. He's moving into a house in Palo Alto. That's right. So where, where in the world? Uh, you don't have to give us your GPS. Oh, I'm on the Stanford this. University campus. Uh, ah. We live in what's affectionately known as the faculty ghetto. And it's very different from the shtetls or ghettos that my grandparents lived in in Europe and uh, before coming to this country. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. So why, why has Palo Alto been so successful? Because, I mean, 40, 50 years ago, it was nothing, really. Well, actually, it... 70, it was always, it was something, but it, it's grown tremendously. Um, I'm from New York, from the Bronx, and uh, someone I spoke to out here put it very well. I said, I like the common sense of the Midwest. And what she said was, well, if you go out in a snowstorm in the Midwest and maybe in Scotland, in, in the rural parts, uh, and there's not a clothesline between you and the barn, you die. We live in a Garden of Eden, uh, which means that we can be more open to crazy ideas, some of which turn out to be brilliant, including Silicon Valley. And so I often say that if I still lived in the Bronx, and maybe this is not true now, but it was certainly true when I grew up, if I told people I wanted to start a um, uh, company in my garage, they'd say, "What do you? who do you think you are, Henry Ford? Whereas out here, people say, please show me your business plan. I'd like to invest if it's a good one. Yeah. So we live in the Garden of Eden is the simple answer. Yeah. And do you think that's the difference between MIT and and, and and Stanford? MIT is this ivory tower of great mathematics and science, and Stanford is this, yeah, let's, let's, let's well, go also, for it. But... I think MIT was established, Stanford was coming up, and uh, so um, uh, uh, Terman, uh, Frederick Terman, who was the provost and who told uh, Hewitt Packard to start Hewitt Packard, and really uh, helped start Silicon Valley. Uh, I think he was always looking for ways to innovate and he had to be more nimble than MIT. Uh, so that's my guess. Oh, that's another reason, but I don't know. We were just, we were very lucky. Yeah. And you were born in 1945 in, in October New York? 45, and... yes. My father was still on Hawaii. Uh, yeah. He'd been in the service uh, all during World War II and sent to school after school and then in uh, March 45, with my mother three months pregnant with me and with a two and a half year old older brother, he was three when I was born, he got orders to ship out on a troop train to uh, the, um, uh, I think it was Seattle, and he got on a troop ship headed for the South Pacific. Of course, they didn't tell him where he was going. And I sometimes marvel at my mother, you know, how she did put up with this, how my father put up with it. Fortunately, when he got to Hawaii, they said, you get off the ship here, and he was setting up uh, radio direction finder nets uh, for the Pacific to locate down flyers. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, I was born right after World War II. Yeah, it's probably probably not the best time to be born, but... Uh, oh, it's but, a great time to be born. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a great time. You know, your students are born in a different time. It's it, it, Every time, every time has its opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's great. And you went to Bronx High School of Science. Uh, do you Yes. think you were always destined for a career in maths and science? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was ridiculous. I was eight years old or nine years old. I was in third or fourth grade, was studying the explorers. And I wanted to be an explorer. I wanted to sail like John Cabot or uh, uh, Christopher uh, Columbus. And I was sad because I knew I couldn't be an explorer because I had to be a scientist. I didn't know about engineering. Uh, uh, and how I knew that at eight or nine is beyond me, but I knew it. That's great. And then you did a degree and a master's course and a PhD in electrical engineering. Why electrical engineering and not physics or maths? Well, actually, originally I thought physics uh, because my father was a physicist. My uh, uncle who taught me physics at Bronx Science uh, was obviously a physicist, uh, but I became a ham radio operator in my uh, senior year of high school. And that was the equivalent of computers today. And that got me interested in electrical engineering. And I actually went back and forth between a few other things, but I ended up in electrical engineering. Actually, that's a useful story. I was in... Uh, it was called engineering science in my sophomore year. I wanted to take more physics than the average electrical engineer. And so I, I, I went into the exper experimental program called engineering science, and they made me take more math. So they made me take linear algebra uh, in my sophomore year. And I left the program saying, this is the most useless theoretical abstract math course I'd ever taken, but only because it was taught in a math department And where they didn't want to connect it to reality. Then when I got to graduate school, it was the most useful course I'd ever taken in quantum mechanics and uh, state-space approach to dynamic systems. Everything was matrices. That's amazing. And, and you started your career off in the, the famous IBM Research Center, 1968, 1969 in, in New York, uh, Correct. that created such amazing work, SQL, the DES, Cypher, and, and so on. I think you had some contact with Horst Feistel Yeah, quite, at the quite time. so. Uh, I was hired in September 68, and Feistel was hired about the same time. We were in the same department, but uh, I didn't work on cryptography, but I had lunch with him, and I identify my work at IBM and getting to know Horst as one of the key influences that led me into cryptography. One of the others, by the way, was uh, when I went to MIT to teach 69 to 71, Peter Elias, who was one of the original contributors to information theory, which was the area that I was working in, in which I'd done my PhD, Peter gave me a paper connecting that Shannon, Claude Shannon, had written in 1949 in the BSTJ, connecting information theory and cryptography. And we actually know now that it was a declassified version of a 1945 report. So it actually appeared before his more famous 1948 papers on information theory. Uh, and the two really evolved at the same time. But um, basically, I realized that, that cryptography is a branch of information theory, which I had not realized up to that point. And so I thought maybe I can do something, and that got me interested also as well. Yeah. And why did IBM get into the, I think, it's, is it named after Thomas Watson, Jr.? Yeah, T.J. Watson Research Center in uh, Yorktown, Yeah, New York. yeah. They got into cryptography because TSS, time-sharing system, which was the big IBM system, uh, they were concerned about you and me having data in the same computer. How are they going to keep it secret? I think that was the main uh, reason. But by the time VES came about, they realized that banking and communications was much more important. Yeah. And so by 1969-1970, you were an academic at MIT, and then you moved to Stanford in 70, 71. 1971. Then, we bought the house that we now live in. We were house poor for oh, five years. <laughs> it's you all. still live in the same house that, Yeah, that we've you got, had well, in... it's a different house in a way. It's the same physical structure outside, except we had it 50 feet in one of the bathrooms. Uh, the, when we lost another house that we were going to bid on, Dorothy said, why don't you look at the house with the small bathrooms, which was this one. So when we did a remodel 27 years ago, we added 50 square feet in one of the bathrooms. That's right. And then by 1996, Yeah, actually, 90, I, you had re retired. So... officially 96, effectively 95. Uh, it, uh, I, I didn't, I retired very early. I started teaching when I was 23 at MIT. So retiring at 50 uh, might have, or 51, uh, depending on which you use, official or uh, effective, uh, may seem strange. But uh, uh, there's a strong force within me saying, get out. Uh, and it started slowly It's with committees. 
uh, and the job I used to love became more and more burdensome. And at first I thought it was because my wife's health was was not good uh, and I needed to slow down. But now I realize is I needed to slow down as well. I've since picked up uh, the pace, but it was important to slow down as well. It, and we spoke to Witt and he said he stayed with the mighty Leslie Lamports, who I think is, uh, after Shannon, has one of the most cited papers in the world around the Byzantian And also general... La Tech, which many of us many of the oh, know. Yeah. Leslie Lamport Tech. It's uh, Don Knuth developed tech and Leslie uh, developed a La Tech out of it. That's right, yeah. Very award winner, I mean, by the way. Uh, Turin, yeah, and and really, without LaTeX, we we wouldn't be able to write research papers in such good quality. What do you remember about Leslie? Well, first of all, what I remember about Wit is when we did New Directions in Cryptography, we were writing that paper. I'd been invited to write a paper by uh, um, Jim Massey, who is the editor of the Information Theory Transactions of the IEEE, and I asked him if I could include. I actually more than asked. I said I'd like to include Wit as co-author, and this was in the days when we still had secretaries typing uh, papers on mats and using changing this IBM Selectric ball to put a Greek one in when you wanted alpha. And Wit had a typesetting um, uh, program uh, available to him at the AI lab, and so he did it all on um, on that system. And what I remember about was I see him every once in a while at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, which is the top prizes in math and computer science. And what I remember about him most recently is about maybe five years ago, he gave a talk in which he said that something like 70% of the papers that he looked at in mathematics journals had errors in their proofs. Uh, yeah. The proofs were correct most of the time, but there were errors in the, in the proofs. And this actually makes some sense to me. I may be getting the numbers wrong, so don't quote me on that. But uh, my first P, the first PhD I turned out was correcting an error in a proof, the, the theorem turned out to be true in a prize-winning paper in the IEEE transactions on information theory. Uh, Charlie Davis uh, mm -hmm. uh, did that thesis, and it was Fred Jelinek's paper that he corrected. That, that, that's amazing. These days we have uh, open access uh, repositories where we can actually put papers and people will review them. And we can correct them before they, they actually get published. Yeah, but this paper had been out there for maybe five years or more, and no one had yeah. noticed the error. Yeah, and it was and a very obvious amazing. error. He assumed in, independent, identically distributed um, uh, uh, samples, and there was a uh, it was a branching process with random environments. It wasn't a true branching process for those who know what that is. That's amazing, and. Uh... It's quite worrying now about the review process. I saw a paper where the abstract started with as an AI agent, I cannot. So it got <laughs> right through the review process. And it was obviously that ChatGPT had been copied and put in the abstract and the paper was published. It's really quite embarrassing for all the people in, involved. But there is papers now that are appearing with obvious ChatGPT. Well, uh, there's another problem. Even before AI, we had a problem with fake news. And it's not just Donald Trump. Uh, I remember Vietnam, and you may remember too, your students will not. Uh, in um, August 1964, Johnson told the American public, he told Congress that the Tonkin Gulf incidents, which became the basis for the Tonkin Gulf resolution, which was the legal basis for the, the America's Vietnamese war, that the, the, an American destroyer had been attacked on the high seas, unprovoked aggression, and he was going to be restrained. He wasn't going to do anything about it. But if they ever did that again, mind you, he was going to really slam them. Two days later, we were told, it turns out to be false, that there was a second attack and he slammed North Vietnam and thus began the Vietnamese War. What we now know is that the second attack never happened. And that comes from an NSA formerly top secret uh, uh, paper on this that's been declassified saying no attack happened that night. That's an exact quote. And the first one, I could play you from my phone a 45 second clip from the Johnson Library. So again, unquestioned provenance, where he says, we were carrying on covert operations in North Vietnam, blowing up roads and bridges and things of that sort. And I suppose they wanted to put a stop. So they fired on us and we sunk them. Not exactly unprovoked aggression. And the situation in Ukraine is not that dissimilar. I mean, there are some relations. Now, I'm not justifying what Putin has done there. I gave a talk at Georgetown about a year ago, year and a half ago, 
in which I quoted the Gospels being Jewish. I felt I could do that, especially at a Catholic institution, uh, which Georgetown is. And I said, I quoted um, the Gospels where Jesus says, why do you worry about the splinter in your neighbor's eye when you've got a two by four in your own? And he doesn't need to say two by four, of course. And I don't know what it would be in metric. Uh, it would be roughly four by uh, five, four by eight centimeters. Uh, and what I said is, given that our neighbor in, in Ukraine is Putin, he doesn't just have a splinter in his eye. He's probably got a four by eight. But the admonition still applies. Let's first remove the two by four from our own eye before we try to help Putin remove the four by eight from his eye. Yeah, that's quite one. And I think with the AI agents, becoming more and more intelligent, then you'll get so much more disinformation happening on the internet. And, and it's, it's, it's going to be very difficult. I mean, I find things on the web. I don't use AI, although I probably should. But uh, once things get, I mean, I find things that are wrong. And when AI starts putting out other things that are wrong, what's, how you, it's going to be very hard to separate them, as I agree. Yep. And so we spoke to Wits, and he was. He said you were so gracious, uh, a true gentleman, and granted him half an hour. <laughs> this amazing professor, I think he had been told from someone in IBM oh, that yeah. he should I can, come I can and see you. you. So what happened yeah. there was, I had been back at IBM to talk about a theory of cryptography, and they basically dismissed me because the secrecy order had descended on them. They couldn't have done the scientific, printed the Scientific American article that Horst had in, I think, 73. Uh, this was probably 74. Uh, and Whit showed up a couple of months later and he says he gave roughly the same talk. And they added just one thing. They said, when you get back to Stanford, woke up Hellman. And we had this half hour meeting, which went into the night because uh, we, you know, it was such a meeting of the minds. Yeah, because uh, I think he said it was a Wednesday afternoon. That's how so significant it was. He said Wednesday. And also that you invited him and Mary, uh, his wife at the time, to, to the dinner. And there was something that was said about dogs. I think there was oh, a yeah. shared interest with so dogs. Is what happened right? was, I said, Whit calls me from, I think, Berkeley, where he was staying, and says, says Alan Conheim at IBM had suggested mm -hmm. he meet with me. So I set up a half, probably a half hour meeting. And we go on for an hour or two uh, because it's it's so exciting. And then I tell Whit, I've got to go home, but it's only five minutes away by car or bike. Because uh, I told my wife I'd watch the children who were then uh, three and five. Uh, and I said, but if you don't mind coming back, we can continue. And he said, only if I can call my, it was his girlfriend at the time, girlfriend. although he regarded her as his wife, Mary. So they came, we invited them to dinner. And they left at 11 o'clock, not unwelcome. Uh, and they, and Mary was very interested in dogs. We had dogs at the time. Dorothy's parents were dog breeders. And uh, uh, also uh, our younger daughter uh, played the harp, which Mary was very interested in. There was a confusion there. Mary thinks thought that Gretchen played the harp because of her, whereas Gretchen maintains that it was because of the monkeys or something, that she saw a monkey, the monkeys on TV playing the, uh, and somebody was playing the harp. Yeah. And uh, so you and Witt published this classic paper, New Directions, and uh, and that really changed the world that proposed public encryption and the, and the Diffie-Hellman method. And did you know how impactful that, pa that paper would actually be on our world? Yes and no. The first paragraph starts off, we stand today on the brink of a revolution in cryptography. So yes, we were full of ourselves and we saw the potential. But uh, the fact that public key cryptography would protect trillions of dollars a day, which it does now, foreign exchange alone is like over five trillion a day uh, protected by public key cryptography. I think that was beyond my comprehension at the time. Yeah. And I asked Witt if he was still a hippie. And he said, <laughs> he, I, he, yes. I, I'm surprised then? he says that because he. I'm surprised <laughs> he admits to being one. I mean, he's got this long, blonde, got now, long white yeah. hair. Uh, except now he wears suits instead of the AI uniform. My wife used to joke that uh, when we met Wit, he was wearing the AI uniform, which was black, black slacks, uh, white socks, and I think tennis shoes and a white shirt. Oh, it wasn't quite a happy. No, uh, it was an AI. He, the AI community is very unusual that way. Uh, I don't know how it is now, but I remember John McCarthy, who is one of the. Mm -hmm. uh, 
greats of AI now deceased lives up the hill and what was staying there when we came up with these ideas. Uh, but uh, John had a high school student from Boston living in his attic or someplace in his home and working at the AI lab. And I asked the student why he didn't just work at the MIT AI lab. And he said he didn't like the uh, political environment there. I don't know what that <laughs> meant. But you could, if you remember the AI community, uh, bunk, you know, get almost free housing, free food, maybe, as you traveled around the country, which Witt did learning about cryptography. Yeah, that's amazing. And and I know from the paper, it was really a, a meeting of minds. So you were the mathematical genius behind the, the discrete log method. And he was the one that kind of teased out the opportunity of public key encryption. What made you such a good team? Well, it was very unusual. Usually it's the professor who, because I, mean, I was, I had several jobs. I was uh, teaching courses. I was doing research. I was consulting. I did committees. And Witt had all this time. He was a, I, I took him on as a graduate student. I mean, even though he was a year older than me, because um, he, he, all he had was a bachelor's degree at that point. Um, and usually it's the professor who provides mid-course guidance and the student who does the dog work. I mean, because he has the hours to do it. With Whitney, it was the other way around. Like Whit came up with, he was the first to enunciate the thought of a public key crypto system. Although looking back, there were many things that led us to that that we both worked on. And I was the first one working late one night, probably one o'clock in the morning at this desk to come up with Diffie Hellman. Uh, but um, it was an unusual, it just, it worked well. I, I, and even though it was reversed from the usual situation. That's good. I think 49 years ago, two days ago, was the birthday of Des. It was when it was first published. March publicly. 1975 is when it was published. And yes, that, that would have been, yeah. That's that's right. And 49, it, roughly 49 years ago that they published they, it as a proposed standard. And Witt and I were yeah. naive enough to think that it was actually a proposed standard. Once something appears in the Federal Register, it's set in concrete. Yeah, and you were very critical. Both of you were very critical at, uh, at the time. So obviously you were risking your career. Obviously a lot of dollars comes in from military and defence. So you were both risking uh, your career and some of your research group. What? What? Why did you? Why did you stand up against this mighty <laughs> uh, standard? Against the National Security Agency. I yeah, mean, we took I didn't them on like to almost say single handedly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, the good news is we're good friends. I'm good friends with the NSA now, at least oh, certain good. elements there. I like Admiral Inman, who is the director, uh, yeah. who uh, is now a good friend, and he signed several statements of support, including my project on rethinking national security. But uh, the answer to your question, I think, is twofold. We didn't realize that we were risking anything at first. Yeah. They just published this, and we we saw this problem with the 56-bit key size. And I sent off, with, uh, did some things, and I did some things, and I sent off a, uh, a summary of our concerns to NBS, and they never really responded. We thought they were going to fix it. We thought it was a bug, and they would fix it because it was cheap to fix it. What we realized six months later after multiple letters is it wasn't a bug, it was a feature, not from our point of view, but from NSA's point of view, because it allowed them to break a cryptographic system that almost no one else could break um, for various reasons. And um, uh, then we already were mired in the, in the fight. So the second answer to your question is, I grew up in the Bronx, and I wasn't a very good street fighter. I got beat up a lot. But I was a street fighter with my mouth and my mind, which is no wonder the other kids beat me up. I remember some of the things I said. And so uh, it just was obvious that we had to do this. I remember my mother calling me, though. She was still alive, saying, what are you doing? You're going to get yourself killed doing this. Because uh, we weren't just pissing off NSA. We were pissing off some of their foreign equivalents, including the Soviet uh, equivalent. Yeah. And so about a year after this revest, Shamir and Edelman built on your work. So while you proposed, both of you proposed the opportunity for public key encryption, they actually created the first practical methods uh, that's still used these days and still is the most popular uh, public key encryption method and for, for signatures. Uh, so actually, I don't, think, I don't think, 
I don't think um, RSA is used that much anymore. I think I, I think people. I have to check, but I, I and I check with my friends because I don't really know. I think uh, um, elliptic curve DSA is being used more than uh, RSA now, but I could I could be wrong about yeah. that. It is certainly for blockchain applications at CCDSA because you just oh. never use that RSA. But I think for certificates and for connecting to websites, it's E C D E C D H E ephemeral stroke RSA is still. And if you look at the oh maybe it is ours okay uh, and and PKI, I think the majority are still RSA and a lot of people use it for SSH connections and so on. But elliptic curve is chasing fast uh, with it. So did you know how significant the work was? I mean, I know it was published in Martin Gardner's uh, oh, yeah. article that I used to love, so, Martin Gardner. Let me just give you a little thought. So first of all, Witt and I, November 76 issue, which came out in January 77, because it was the, it was always late, we published the idea of a public key crypto system, crypto system and we came up with what's now Diffie, called diffie Hellman Key Exchange, which is actually a Merkle system, which is a, a whole other story. Ralph Merkle was an undergraduate and then a master's student working at Berkeley with no help from any of the faculty there. And uh, we didn't know about each other. We came up with these ideas independently. And he had half of public key cryptography. He had the um, uh, privacy part, but not the digital signature part. Uh, we had in our paper the idea of digital signatures, but didn't have a way of implementing it because diffie hellman Key Exchange is really a Merkle system. And then uh, RSA, R Ravesh Shamir Adelman, came up with the RSA system about a year later. And I could have kicked myself when I read the paper because Steve Polig and I had come up with something, uh, a conventional cr crypto mm -hmm. system, which we published uh, a little bit later although we'd come up with it much earlier. And we'd realized you could do it mod N instead of mod P, which made it into RSA. But we didn't yet have the idea of a public key crypto system, so we didn't realize that we never came back to it. So RSA was quite a, an important uh, advance. Yeah, and what talked about the work at GCHQ, Cox, Williamson, and Ellis, and that they had, in parallel, created uh, this public key encryption methods that was similar to, to RSA. Did you know anything of the work of GCHQ at, at the time? Not at the time. Well, of course, it wasn't published until the 90s. And it well, it bothered me. Um, it was somebody, one of the, um, I think it was Gus Solomon, who's one of the great, Gus uh, Sol, Reed Solomon codes, uh, who wrote an, uh, uh, an email and he sent it to me, among other people, saying for the real story about the discovery of public key cryptography, read this article, and it was the article in which uh, uh, they talked about the GCHQ work. And I was really pissed at the time because um, my colleagues had all discouraged me from doing working in cryptography. And one of their arguments was, uh, uh, how can you hope to discover anything new? Uh, NSA has a multi-year, and GCHQ has a multi-decade head start, uh, a huge budget, and I said, it doesn't matter what they know, it's well established who gets credit. It's the first to publish, not the first to discover and keep secret. And so as I thought about this, I realized there are kind of two parallel universes. In the unclassified world, it's Diffie, Merkel, and myself, and RSA who deserve the credit, and GCHQ is a footnote, because we don't even know what they're, what they're saying is true. I mean, I believe it is, but we don't. We have no, we have no way of knowing in the 1990s when they say here's the paper from the 1970s, and in the unclassified literature, we're a footnote, and they're the main point. point. Uh, the good news is uh, it hasn't really hurt us. As, as someone put it to Shockley, one of the inventors of the transistor, when he tried to claim all the credit, he said, "Don't be an ass, Shockley. There's plenty of credit to go around." That's right. Yeah, I think uh, Shockley's company didn't Shockley go very far. Shockley Semiconductor. Yeah, because he really struggled to work, and he wanted to take a lot of the credits. Um, uh, yeah, it, it never succeeded, but it was integral in Silicon Valley because the traitorous eight uh, left to form Fairchild, semicon uh, whatever it's called, Semiconductor, and then Intel and everything else. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it just showed that that when you work in a research team. Even though you're the leader, you want to share uh, the impact of, of your work and not take all the credit from it. 
something that you've always don't done be an very ass. Well. There's plenty of credit to go around. <laughs> so, so I think in terms of the patents that that built the internet, if you take it right back to Horst Feistel's 1971 patent from uh, IBM. 73, I think, in Scientific American. 73. I think it was ah, 73. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, you, you memorize these things very well. Well, I, I, the... I, 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 I know I left MIT in 71, and it wouldn't, wasn't yeah. that year that he did it. It was 73, I'm almost certain. Yeah. The problem with patents is that you submit them and, and it takes years before they're actually granted. So it's very difficult to pinpoint the time that the invention really happened. Well, there's another thing. I sometimes joke that the United States and probably the United Kingdom has the best legal system money can buy. Mm. And it's who has the most money that's going to determine a lot of what who wins. And so the bottom line here is um, um, RSA sold their company for $250 million. They refused to pay royalties to Stanford and Stanford rolled over and played dead because we didn't have the money to go, go against them. And they didn't, it was probably a bluff on their part because they didn't have the money either. And we made almost no money off of public key cryptography. So I was really pissed that RSA and Jim Bidzos, the president of RSA, data security for many years. But after the patent fight was settled, which they largely won, uh, I realized it was inconsistent with my uh, philosophy of life to be pissed at them. And so I approached Jim and uh, said, look, let's bury the hatchet. And I actually reframed it in my mind, which some of my friends have told me is crazy. But Initially, I viewed that Jim Bidzos and RSA had stolen money from my pocket. I thought it through again from their perspective, and I came to see how they could see the fight is all my fault, not theirs. And also, I realized that in a way, Jim Bidzos put money in my pocket, because while I made no money for very little money from our patents, um, I did make money. For, I was one of the original advisors to PayPal. That made me some money uh, and other things like that. And Jim is a fan, he's a great engineer, but he's also a fantastic marketer. And public key cryptography would not have become as popular if it hadn't been for Jim marketing it the way he did. And that's part of what led to PayPal. And so I approached Jim, he uh, he received me well and he reconnected me with RSA. We're all good friends now, much better. And so one of the things I talk about is friends are better than enemies. And that's a good example. Yeah, I think when we talked to Len uh, Edelman, he actually said that MIT were, were quite protective of, of the patent, where I think perhaps Stanford did not protect the, the patent. So the RSC patent made a lot of money, and they obviously created their business being aggressive with, with the patent. But obviously the Diffie-Hellman method, if you had made one nanocent on every time Diffie-Hellman was made, you'd be a, a trillionaire probably these yeah, days. Also uh, I didn't understand patents when we filed those patents, and Stanford used a summer intern who was a law student to write the first patent to save money, which was a big mistake. I now understand if I knew, knew ne then what I know now, I would have written the patent more, the claims more generally to cover uh, a method of secure um, communication using exponentiation and modular arithmetic, which RSA also uses and would have covered their patent, but it's only the claims that matter. Yeah, and I didn't know that then. Yeah, and you obviously published patents with with Ralph Ralph Merkel, and I think yeah. the Merkel tree patent is the sh oh. one of the shortest patents I think I've ever seen. It's like a drawing of the Merkel tree, and, and yeah, and, and it's, it's essential in uh, <clears throat> blockchain and many other areas. And the cryptanalytic time memory trade off that I came up with for DES. Uh, with, there's a paper of that name which on my publications list, which you can easily get to. You can send it to your students if you want. Uh, the, ra the the rainbow tables are a minor ex an extension of that idea, and they're used very widely now. I understand. And Ralph was such a genius, as you said, as an undergraduate student, he came up with the idea of public key encryption that he presented to his professor. And his professor gave him feedback, saying, "This is a crazy idea." I like the other one. And then obviously he was you you worked with him. What what made him so special, do you think? Well, Witt says that I was a okay, I'm gonna bring up uh here it is. Yep, here it is. Let me I'm gonna sh show it on the screen. Yep. Uh let's see, I'm gonna go to screen share. 
and let's see where is it? Chase Street. What is this? this is CS two forty four proposal. There it is. Can you see the blue ink at the top? Yeah. Yeah. Project. So Ralph proposed two, uh, to, uh, two projects for CS two forty four in the fall of nineteen seventy four. Uh, the first was public key cryptography. The second was something much more mundane. The professor wrote, and you can see in blue ink, project two looks more reasonable, maybe because your description of project one is muddled terribly. Talk to me about this today. Well, Ralph, instead of talking with him, dropped the course and continued on his own. Yeah, yeah. So, what, so, yeah. so you asked what made me real, see the, 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 the value in Merkel. Witt has said I'm a great talent scout, uh, and he's right. I mean, I saw it in him. I saw it in Ralph. I saw it in Tyrell Gamal, the El Gamal signature scheme. Uh, I'm also, I'm not just a good talent scout. I mean, I came up with Diffie Hellman uh, Key Exchange, but I am a good talent scout. I really do recognize uh, a talent when I see it and craziness when I see it, which is really the best form of talent in many ways. Yeah, and I think that makes a leader. A leader is the person who can spot that talent and build the team and and enable the talent to to thrive. So another person you worked with was Stephen Pollock, obviously a dear departed. Now, yeah, as you said, he created in you the ex explanation cipher. What do you think his core contribution to cryptography actually was? What would be his best um, thing that he did? Well, we came up with um, RSA, <laughs> but didn't realize it, I'd say. But uh, uh, it was showing uh, how exponentiation and modular arithmetic could be used to create a, a crypto, a conventional crypto system, which we did publish. And then if we had paid attention to our own musings, we would have seen that it produced a public key system, even though we didn't know that, that uh, about that idea when we first came up with it, probably in 74, 75. That's great. And uh, we talked to Tahir, too, which is quite a privilege. I think he's working for SAS uh, now. And he said, you said to him, here's 12 problems that are not solvable at the current time. Go and investigate them. So he solved one. Can you remember even just one of the 12 or was it just a Who one? Who is this? Uh, Tahir. Uh, oh, Tahir. Uh, Gamo. Yeah. I don't know that I said that to him. It was more, Tahir came... Uh, to Stanford around 1980, I think. And his brother, Abbas Al-Gamal, had already been here as a student and school, was teaching at I USC think. at the time. And then he came back yeah. on the faculty and was later department chair. And I remember thinking, well, just because his brother was good doesn't mean he'll be good. Uh, but he was really good. And uh, he worked. his work was done largely on his own because I became interested in Beyond War at that time. And uh, my interests were... Uh, so I supervised him, but I wasn't as intimately involved in his work and Tyre came up not only with the El Gamal signature scheme, but also with the essence of what um, uh, he used quadratic integers to improve factoring algorithms, which an extension of that was important in doing the quadratic sieve. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been told by people who developed the quadratic sieve that they were motivated partly by Tyre's work. Uh, and then, of course, he was chief scientist at Netscape and developed SSL3 there with uh, Paul Kotcher, who's another good friend. Yeah, and I think the El Gamo method has now been used uh, fairly extensively in zero-knowledge proofs and homomorphic encryption. It's now an elliptic curve method, but it's really advanced greatly uh, from there. And, uh, yeah, so you, you interacted also with the Marconi Prize winners of uh, Jim Clark and Paul Kocha, and I think Tahir also worked with them. Uh, what role did they play in securing the internet? Well... Um, Jim Clark, of course, started Netscape and uh, uh, Tyre, he hired Tyre as the uh, chief scientist. And I have an email from Tyre asking if I could recommend a student, maybe about 1994, uh, can I recommend someone to work on uh, some cryptographic work? And I sent him two names, one of which was Paul Kotcher. And I told him, don't let the fact that he doesn't have any degrees yet bother you. He knows more cryptography than I do. And now he has only a bachelor's degree in biology he was going to be a veterinarian uh and but he he's a fantastic uh um uh, information security person he developed timing analysis power analysis 
And he sold his company for $350 million wow. about a dozen years ago, uh, Cryptography wow. Research Inc. Yeah, that's great. But today in the class, we did SSL and TLS, and I talked about Netscape, which none of the students would have heard. And the problem and Netscape was, was the first SSL, browser. That's right. And SSL one version one really was was uh, limited with its cryptography, and it caused so many so many problems. Yeah, um, SSL three which... lasted about twenty years, I think, uh, uh, yeah. which is amazing. So Paul did a Paul and Tyre did a great job there. Yeah, still still around, is still used. We did a, a scan of websites today, and there's still a few that are still using SSL three and TLS one, and. Uh, there was some, you've been a great mentor to so many amazing people, John Gill and Manuel Blum's name. Oh, John Gill, I wasn't a mentor to John Gill. John did, yeah. a, he, he did his PhD into Manuel Blum at Berkeley, and yeah. he was the one who suggested uh, discrete logarithms to me as a mathematical function, because he, he has his PhDs in mathematics. So I went to John asking him for suggestions. Yeah, that's good. And we spoke to Niall Koblitz, who I think is still a professor at the University of Washington, and he was the co-inventor of elliptic curve cryptography, which went nowhere for a long time. Uh, and then it, it took off, obviously, when Satoshi Nakamoto adopted it for, for Bitcoin. And he outlines a very strong anti-war stance when he was when he was younger. Is there something in the cryptography community that, that has this anti-establishment feeling or is it, or is it just individuals that, that have this? Well, I told you when I first started working in cryptography, my colleagues told me uniformly that I was crazy to do it and they were right, but it was crazy like a fox based on the Turing Award and other things. I've had a, the opportunity to ask six Nobel laureates who I've met whether the work that won them their Nobel Prizes had initially been encouraged or discouraged. Five of the six clearly were roundly discouraged and the sixth one was pretty close. One of them, uh, Danny Sheckman, who won the 2011 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for quasi-crystals, told me that no less an authority than Linus Pauling, who won two Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry and one in Pete, one for peace, called it quasi-science. And what Danny said is, but I knew I was right, and he just waited for the world to come around. So I think in terms of, I mean, we keep getting into wars for stupid reasons. I mean, Vietnam is a good example that I've just given. Ukraine is harder to see. It's harder to see what two by four we have in our eye. Although I've said Putin has a four by eight in his eye, an even bigger uh, piece of wood, uh, plank. But a good example there is there was a poll done, which I've confirmed by talking to one of the lead researchers, by the University of Chicago, four months after the invasion of Ukraine, in Ukraine. In it, 85% of Ukrainians blame Russia for the war, which is no big surprise. But 70% also blame their own government, and 58% blame the United States, which surprises most people. It didn't surprise me because I understand. Uh, so it's looking, going beyond the mainstream narrative and looking for how is this different? How could this be wrong? And uh, often it's right, but sometimes it's wrong. Yeah. And so, yes, Putin was wrong to invade Ukraine, but the United States made many mistakes, as did their own government. And as yeah. just one example there, 40 members of the U.S. Congress signed a letter in 2019, so five years ago, asking the U.S. State Department to declare an element of Ukraine's military, the Azov Battalion, a foreign terrorist organization because of its Nazi roots. And we've seen with the Oppenheimer movie being so successful that he created this beast that he regretted uh, greatly. And you have always had a stance uh, against nuclear weapons, where do you stand now in in their usage? My, well, my stance is not not against nuclear weapons. As we discussed when we were getting ready for this, I said the group I worked with in the eighties, which I grew, drew on, still draw on heavily, even though we left it before it imploded and ended about twenty years ago. Um, the group said we need we can't slay the dinosaur. We can't just get rid of nuclear weapons. We have to build the gazelle. And the group was called Beyond War because it started with the nuclear threat, but it realized, and I still agree with this, that you can't just get rid of nuclear weapons in the current world environment. You need to build a much more peaceful world. And what people don't realize is 
that the only choices we have are building that world, which we tried to do for thousands of years and found ourselves incapable of doing. Either we're going to do it now or we're not going to survive as a species. The risk is horrendous. I did it. I published a paper two and a half, actually three years ago now, which Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defense, PhD in math, told me he agreed with and gave me permission to quote him, which estimated that the risk of a major nuclear war, even before the invasion of Ukraine, even before the Gaza war, was on the order of 1% per year. So worse than 50-50 odds over the life of a child born today. Now, why am I excited by this? Because the nuclear threat viewed from a different angle is the nuclear opportunity. We can't just get rid of the weapons. We have to build a more peaceful world. We have to look at Ukraine and we have to look at Gaza and understand that yes, Israel has a, a, a valid perspective. The Palestinians have a valid perspective. How are we going to try to reconcile these? How are we gonna to try to reconcile Ukraine's desire for independence and Russia's desire for security? How are we going to actually Ukraine's desire for security as well? I have a project called uh, Rethinking National Security and uh, I'll ask you to send the links to the class um, to both the free PDF of the book my wife and I wrote uh, on creating true love at home and peace on the planet, and also the Rethinking National Security um, uh, homepage, uh, which, by the way, has the support of a former Secretary of Defense, uh, Leon Panetta. Um, and uh, so we, my stance now is that we can't just get rid of nuclear weapons. If that's all we did in the current environment and nothing else changed, the world would actually be more dangerous. Because what would happen? The United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, all the nations that knew how to build these weapons would race to try to reconstitute their arsenals in the current environment. And whoever got there first would be tempted to use them while it enjoyed a temporary nuclear monopoly. And so I have a diagram that from a paper in, I think, 2011. Let me see where it is. Uh, let's see, here it is. Yep. Share screen. Are you seeing the diagram? Yep, yep, perfect. Thanks. Okay, so I divide the world into three super states. The world as we know it, which is where we've been for uh, forever. Nuclear disaster, which we crossed the first time a nuclear weapons used in war. And Hiroshima and Nagasaki do not count because the United States had a monopoly. But if today a nuclear weapon we used, we could recover from that. Oh, world War Three, which is the end state, is a state of no return. And... I'd also have a positive super state called New Thinking, uh, where, which we crossed the first time somewhat arbitrarily. We have a thousand warheads in worldwide. And I define the ultimate state not as zero, zero nuclear weapons, but as a state of acceptable risk. And it must be an absorbing state because if you can come back from it, the risk is not acceptable. And that probably involves nuclear disarmament, but Rather than stating that now and creating a lot of opposition, let me call it a state of acceptable risk. So this is where I stand now. This is what we need to do. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, the project on rethinking national security talks about what we need to do. Uh, in summary, we need to stop thinking in terms of national security and start thinking of global security. National security and global security are becoming inseparable in the nuclear age, the AI age, the cyber age, all these ages in which we live. Climate change, too, is another example. You can't solve that just by one country can't solve it by itself. It's a global problem. Yeah. And perhaps the EU is a good example of how you bring countries together and try to break down the, the barriers that, uh, that, we, that, that we face. And what so, but yes, by the way. This sounds this sounds impossible, and it is right now. And actually, coming back to that diagram, those who say that World War Three will never happen or will never solve the problem are right in the small sense, but wrong in the large sense. There's no direct path from the middle of the world as we know it, super state, to World War Three. You have to make a sequence of mistakes, and there's similarly possibilities that open up as we make a move in the positive direction. Yeah, that's good. And what? talked about his, his wife, his ex, uh, uh, his, his wife, uh, dear departed wife. And, Mary. And how, Mary, yeah, and, and how she supported him through his his career and really was a rock for him and opened so many doors. You see the 
family and your wife as a as a core part of your of the way that you've developed in your career and the importance of the family uh, in uh, our our lives. Could you just expand a little bit on that? Oh well, the book our book on creating true love at home and peace on the planet goes into it in more detail. In it, I say Dante had his Beatrice, if you've read The Inferno, and she was his guide to the lower reaches of heaven. And I said, I've got my Dorothy, and she's lived up to the meaning of her name, a gift from God. And Dorothy then says, I, stop, I love what you're saying, but I'm, but it's embarrassing me. But it's really true. Uh, we haven't had a fight in almost 20 years, and maybe 20 years now. And this was beyond my comprehension. I grew up in a Woody Allen movie in the New York Jewish culture. Uh, people fought all the time. The idea that we could have, we could talk, we could disagree, and yet not fight uh, was beyond my comprehension. And I give Dorothy the credit for that. And I think every day I'd say if there were a Nobel Prize for relationships, she would win it. Uh, and uh, so I don't see her as being as critical in my work in cryptography as Witt sees Mary, but she's critical in this other area. And she's been very supportive of me. I'll just mention one other thing. About 20, 25 years ago, it bothered me that American Christians were supporting our wars uh, uh, beyond that of the average, the non-Christian America. Uh, and because Christ was, Jesus was supposed to be the Prince of Peace. He said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. And so at first I was resistant to this, but then I, 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 I reverted to resist not evil, which is very few Christians know, but it's essential in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I have an essay on this in my, um, um, which I wrote for the 125th birthday of Gandhi, which you can send a link to the students if you need it, ask me. Um, and I thought, well, wait a minute. If American Christians were to realize what Jesus really taught instead of what they think he taught, then they could be the vanguard for building the world we need to, to survive. And so I wrote a piece called The Second Coming Could Now Be the Time, which I'm not going to send you. And Dorothy said to me, I've supported you in some crazy approaches, but this one's too crazy, just give up on it. And then Brendan O'Regan, who founded the Dublin um, uh, Duty Free Shops and won many awards, he's now deceased. Uh, he won many awards from the Irish government and was the founder of the Irish Peace Institute, which helped bring peace to Northern Ireland. Uh, Brendan O'Regan uh, came, came across this, was very taken with it. And he said, I know all the bishops of Ireland, both Catholic and Anglican, and he wanted to send them, send it to them. Unfortunately, he died before that could happen because he was in ill health. But Dorothy said to me, never let me discourage you again. And and we see the rise of ChatGPT and Google Bard. Do you think this is a threat to our world, or do you think it's really an advancement of humankind? Is it a threat to democracy? Where where do you see AI going? It's like cryptography. It has positive and negative, and it's a question of how we use it and whether we grow up. Uh, in my speech, which you can also link, uh, it's on my publications page to the Nobel laureates, twenty nineteen. I said, the real problem is not nuclear weapons or AI or cryptography or cybersecurity or climate change. Those are symptoms of a deeper underlying problem. Technology has given human beings godlike physical power. And our, our, there's a chasm between that physical power that technology has given us and the, at best, irresponsible adolescent behavior that we show. And so I said, humanity is like a 16-year-old kid with a new driver's license who somehow gets his hands on a 500 horsepower, which I think would be 400 kilowatt Ferrari sports car. We're either going to grow up really fast or we're going to kill ourselves. And I'm working to try to make sure we survive. I may fail, but at least I'll go down fighting and maybe we'll succeed. Yeah, and I suppose it's a different type of war with an AI world. We have our guns and tanks and weapons in a traditional war, but an AI war might be a war against the stock exchange where super intelligent AI bots fight to gain profit and could bring down our whole economy. So do you think we will change 
the concept of war, or do you think in 30, 40 years we'll oh, still be fighting with each other? I think if 100 years from now we're still fighting wars, we won't be here. Because one of these yeah. will eventually escalate out of control the way Ukraine has almost done several times and might still uh, to a full-scale nuclear war. Uh, people can't have trouble envisioning this, and I have trouble envisioning it even, but it could, it definitely can happen. So I think we are going to change. We'll either become, we we'll either grow up, we'll learn to drive responsibly on, with that 500 horsepower car, or we'll, we'll kill ourselves. And we need to grow up. And I believe yeah. we can. I know we can. If people would see that the choice is between that, is between survival and the mentality of war. They don't see that right now. They think we can continue fighting wars without ever having it escalate to World War III. But eventually it will happen. Yeah. It's inevitable. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's just like playing Russian roulette. It doesn't matter whether there are six chambers or 600 chambers in the gun. If you keep pulling the trigger every year, it's only a question of time before the gun goes off. Yeah. And can I ask about the books behind you there? And I, I also see some certificates Okay. What's, what's your well, What's see. your favorite book? So let's see. First of all, this that certificate is that one is from when I gave a talk on the evolution of public key cryptography. <laughs> this one underneath it is the Turing Award certificate. Yeah. And over here, you can probably see JFK. Okay. Yeah. Can you see him there? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. That's the transcripts of the uh, Kennedy tapes from the Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, 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 time around that. Um, and my favorite books actually are the ones that I've done. Uh, a New Map for Relationships, which is available as a free PDF. And people can download it for free, read the first story, which takes all of 30 seconds. Dorothy gets so mad at me that she tears a map out of my hands 35 years ago and tears it to shreds and throws it all over the car. It ends with us both laughing. If you like that story, identify it or read some more. And in any event, read the international case studies, which take five minutes each. And then this one um, is called Breakthrough Emerging New Thinking, or in Russian, Proriv. Uh, it, I was the Western editor, Anatoly Gromyko, the son of Andrei Gromyko. The joke was he was the Soviet foreign minister for life, was the uh, Soviet editor. It was published late in 1987 in Moscow in Russian and in English in uh, New York simultaneously. And it's the equations of survival for the nuclear age. And I'll just read you one of the endorsements, which comes from William Colby, former director of the CIA. He called it an impressive and immensely valuable product of Soviets and Americans trying to surmount the mountains which separate our cultures. There's more, but I'll, I won't read it all. So, yeah. and then I, um, oh, there's so, it's not just books. I read Johnson's Russia list every day. I read the New York Times. I read the Wall Street Journal. I read uh, Washington Post every day. But I also find British papers often cover things that American papers don't. So I read Johnson's Russia list, which is a yes. fire hose of roughly 20, 30 articles about Russia, uh, some in the New York Times, some from RT and TASS. And when I find something in RT, the old Russia Today or TASS, I can't use it. But I then look, and I often find it in The Guardian or one of the British newspapers, uh, the more liberal ones, uh, covered there, and I can use that. Uh, and so uh, that that's something I do a lot. Yeah, well, you'd be glad to know that uh, I think there's some protection on the media in, uh, in the UK so that it doesn't fall into foreign hands and change its, its perspective. So I think we are protecting uh, freedom of speech here and democracy and well that's interesting was... we, we rebelled against you because we wanted those freedoms and now you have them more than we do <laughs> yeah and uh if there was one thing in your whole career and I'm, there, there's probably nothing that you would ever change but what would be the one thing you could change that i wouldn't change anything career? i wouldn't would change anything change? even <laughs> the mistakes that i made in my marriage i mean we were close to divorce 10 years into our marriage and now we, as i said we haven't had a fight in 20 years but Dorothy and I have both said that we wouldn't be here if we, we probably wouldn't, we almost surely would not be here if we hadn't gone through that. Uh, what Dorothy said is if life with me had been bearable, she might have put up with it. But because it was unbearable, she was going to get it right. So all those mistakes weren't really mistakes. They were part of getting us where we are today. If you know the Princess Bride, the movie, 
it's a cult classic and I encourage people to watch it. It's, it seems like a children's movie, but it isn't. Uh, Dorothy says, we had to go through the fire swamp to get here. And those of you who watch it or will watch it will know what I'm talking about. Great. And if you were to give some advice to a researcher or for a graduate student, what advice would you tell them in th to focus on in, in their studies? Well, my advice would be more general. It would be don't be discouraged by people telling you you're working on something that's crazy. You probably are. But I have a talk, The Wisdom of Foolishness, which you can also uh, send the link for. It was about 15 years ago at Stanford or asked me for it. And uh, at that time, I had not yet talked to the Nobel laureates, so I could not quote the six of them and Danny Sheckman saying that the work that won them the Nobel Prizes had been discouraged. But I quote uh, um, John Chaffee, who developed DSL. He was laughed out of the room at Bell Labs when he talked about DSL. Um, Trying to remember. Uh, oh, GPS. The the Air Force thought it was crazy at first, uh, and I, there are reasons for it. Um, and um, oh, uh, Federico Fagin, the who designed the first microprocessor at Intel. Again, the work was seen as crazy. Uh, so don't be discouraged by people thinking you're doing something crazy. And don't be discouraged if your first 19 ideas don't go anywhere. It sometimes takes at least 20 swings at what I call wild pitches to hit what a full home run. And so who but a fool would be excited by idea number 20 when ideas 1 through 19 all fell on their faces and idea number 20 doesn't look any better a priori. And yet who's, who's going to connect with that wild pitch and hit the full home yeah. run if you're not excited by it? Yeah. And my very final question, I could I could talk to you all night, I, I, I promise, but I, but I won't. And so I think we uh, published four papers, of which one was really famous, and obviously it was so impactful. Of all the papers that you've written, your cryptography papers, which one was the best, or which one did you enjoy doing most? I would say New Directions in Cryptography. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was such a perfect paper. <laughs> it was it was so well crafted and, and obviously people could see the impact of the paper. Can you interesting as a thing final... there? Yeah. Whit, yeah. Whit and I had written the first version of we sent it off and we sent it off to some people to look at because we weren't happy with it. And they said it's great. So when you know, when you're close to something, it's 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 often you're too close. Yeah, I think these we, days, by the way, people's... didn't yet have Diffie Hellman key exchange. That no. we added that later. And maybe maybe yeah. it was privacy and authentication, the uh, paper that appeared a few years later. Maybe I'm confusing the two, but yeah, I think papers are just produced like a production line these days. They're just so quick. There's no heart in them. They don't. They aren't crafted as well. People need to get the metric scores for citations and so on. Yeah, I don't have that. Bill. If you look at my publications page, I have almost 100 publications, but many of them are repeats. If you look, yeah. I actually have about. <laughs> maybe 20 or 30 really good publications. And that's that's a lot. Uh, uh, I think we need to look at quality more than quantity. Yeah, I totally agree. And definitely, definitely the very last question. So you could you just explain the Diffie-Hellman method as, as you postulated it? Well, uh, John Gill had suggested y equal alpha to the x mod q as a one-way function. And I was trying to develop it into a conventional system, which we'd done with Steve Polig. And, that, that, uh, and then I was trying to come up that night in uh, May 1976 at this desk with a public key system. And I tried different things and I said, okay, let's assume that um, alpha is fixed and Q is fixed. And so it's only Y and X that are secret and which could be the secret key and which could be the public key was clearly X had to be the secret key because going from X to Y was easy, but going from Y, the public key to X was hard. And so I then tried various things and I said, let's say that your Y1 equals alpha to the X1 mod Q, that's yours, your X and Y, mine are Y2 equal alpha to the X2 mod Q. How can I combine them? Multiplying, dividing. And eventually I came up with uh, repeated exponentiation. I took your y1, raised it to the x2 power, which was my secret value. Mm -hmm. You took my y2, which is public, raised it to the x1 power that only you know, 
and you get the same result because exponentiation is commutative. It doesn't matter if you first raise alpha to the x1 power, as you do, and then raise it to the x2, which I did, or do it the other way around, raise alpha to the x2 and then to the x1, you get alpha to the x1, x2. And that was the key result. I didn't trust my 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 um, scribbling, so I had an HP 45 calculator, I think, in those days, and I, I programmed that. it up and it, yeah. it worked. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. I remember these HP calculators. That was the time when HP was an amazing company. <laughs> yes. Uh, so thanks so much. Uh, I think when you speak to many people, one of the finest things that anybody can say about anyone else um, is that they were a, a, a gentleman. <laughs> and I think many people think that you are, you have been a gentleman and you really helped and mentored so many people and obviously created such a great impact. So thanks very much for spending an hour of your time talking to our students. I really appreciate it to be covering the theory in the class and then to do the practical programming and then to meet the person who actually created is a, is a real honor, certainly for me as a professor, uh, but for students, I think it's uh, it's an inspiration. So thank you so much and enjoy well, the rest you. of your day. And one of the reasons I, I, I like doing this is you're at the Napier School, if I remember. And yeah, Napier with right. logarithms was one of these crazy ideas that really paid off. That's, okay, so let's stop true. there. And uh, yeah. let me just say to the class, uh, thank you for your uh, attention. And Bill, thanks for arranging this.